greet each one in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 22. This morning, my theme or my, my emphasis, I want to think about the marriage supper of the Lamb. We know the Passover that the Jews practice and still practice today pointed forward to the sacrifice, the crucifixion that Jesus would go through taking care of our sins. But also, as we think of our communion service today, I believe it points forward towards the marriage supper of the Lamb and the blessings and the incredible event that will be. Matthew chapter 22, beginning at verse 1, And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parable, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king, which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. And again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and treated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, find bid to the marriage. So these, those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And I'm going to pause there. Yes, this is speaking of uh, the fact that the Jews would, many of the Jews would reject Christ when he came, and then God would turn to the Gentiles to open up his plan of salvation to them. But I also want to think of it in the sense of that God is, Jesus is preparing a wedding feast in heaven. And there are those who are going to reject it, those who know about it are too busy today to follow God, to have a relationship with him and they're going to miss out on it, and God's going to turn to those who maybe for the majority of their lives did not serve him, but at the last minute heard the good news and turned to him. But I wanted to focus on the next four verses of chapter 22. And when the king came in to see the guest, he saw there was a man which had not a wedding garment, and he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, cast him into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. So as we think of communion today, are we prepared? Are we wearing, spiritually speaking, are we wearing the proper garment to be ready for communion today? Are we ready to commemorate what Christ did, but also commune with our brotherhood and commune with God through this service today. I hope each one of us are. Now I'd like to turn to where the scripture talks about the marriage supper of the land. Turn with me to Revelations chapter 19. Revelations chapter 19 verse 1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great war which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the, 20 and the, four, el the four and the twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. 
And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude and the voice of many waters, and as the voice of many a mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen and clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. It says that they are blessed who are called to the supper. Who are called? There's no guest list per se in the Bible that we can just look up and see the names of those who are called. But I believe the supper will be for those who are part of the church of Jesus Christ from the time of his resurrection until the rapture. But I could be wrong on that. It may be more people that are included in that. But as we look at this supper of the Lamb and the idea of being a marriage supper, usually those are not just open-ended invitation parties to whoever wants to drop in. There are usually invitations sent out. So thinking of it as being an exclusive event, not an inclusive event. It's not just for anybody. And we see that through and through again when it talks about marriage suppers, just the way we, as we look there in Matthew chapter 22, there was specific people that were invited to come. Yes, God in turn then invited other people, but you still had to be invited to come. And that's what this Supper of the Lamb requires. And as we think today as we go through communion and take part I hope that we are looking forward also to an even greater commemoration or a great, greater time of celebration when we can participate with Jesus in a meal as we look at different uh, passages around communion as we will look at later we see that Jesus was pointing forward to this marriage supper of the Lamb also. But I'd also, I want to continue thinking down to this idea of are we, are we called, are we answering that call? So turn with me to Matthew 25. One of my favorite passages, one of my favorite stories in the scripture but it's also a sobering one. Matthew 25, verse 6. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there not be enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. And afterward came the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know ye not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So it is possible when we think of the marriage supper of the Lamb that it may include all those in heaven, that the exclusiveness those that are excluded will be those like the five foolish virgins who never had a relationship with God. They knew the truth. They knew what they needed to do, but they were not ready. So are we ready today? I hope, my prayer is that each one of you are ready for this communion service, but I also hope that we are ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let's turn now to Luke chapter 22. And look at the story of what, the Last Supper. Luke chapter 22, beginning at verse 1. 
Now the feast of, un of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve, and he went his way and communed with the chief priests and the captains how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and coveted to give him money, and he promised and saw opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. Then came the day of the unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And I'm going to just pause there for now. So we know that later on Judas would commune with the other disciples and with Jesus. And yet he privately was communing with those who wanted to destroy Jesus. It's possible that we can go to church, be a part of a church, a brotherhood, and even take part in communion and yet be as Judas. Our heart is not in it. Our heart is somewhere else. In maybe seeking money, maybe seeking power or prestige. I know it's been talked about by different people, the idea of what all was motivating Judas at this time. Was it just the money? Or was he even possibly attempting to push Jesus into a confrontation with the political leaders of his time so as to elevate his position? And we know even later on, looking in this story, in this very chapter, how even the disciples still did not completely understand why Jesus had come and what his kingdom was going to look like. So it's possible that Judas' motivation wasn't just money. But we know that was part of it with other things we see in Scripture. But yet, he was willing to have his feet and try to have his feet in both worlds, in both kingdoms. Let's pick up at verse 8. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And ye shall say unto the good man of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. Jesus was pointing forward here to something greater, something that had not yet been fulfilled, and that he would not take part in another Passover, or as we see his example here, another communion service, until he would do so in heaven. Luke 26, Matthew 26, and Luke 22 both say, he says, I will not take part of the vine, or referring to drink, of wine or grape juice. It doesn't mean that he would not eat. Some people think that it meant that he wasn't going to ever eat again. But we have in Luke uh, 24, I'm not going to take time to read it, but we have the story of when Jesus had met, walked with the two men on the road to Emmaus. Then those men went back to Jerusalem and met the disciples, told them, and then Jesus appeared as part of his proof to them that he was not just a spirit or something in their imagination. He actually did eat honeycomb and, um, oh, now I'm forgetting the other thing that he ate, fish. And so it wasn't that he never ate again, but he never ate with the significance here of a Passover meal or of communion. But it was, he was indicating that something unique was going to change at this time, and we know that as we see there in the, is the, the, is the, with the coming of the new covenant, that 
it would no longer be done. The Passover would no longer be practiced in the same way by Christians in the same way that the Jews did. Now moving on to um, verses 19 to 37 of Luke 22. And he took the bread and gave thanks and brake it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do ye in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto the man whom he is betrayed. And they began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. And there was also strife among them of which should be accounted the greatest. And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so, but he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief, as he that doth serve. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you, as he that serveth. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. And I appoint you a kingdom as my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on the thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. <clears throat> I'm going to pause there for now. We see here that as Jesus made it clear that one of his disciples would betray him, And yet the other disciples who weren't at that level of betraying Jesus still did not fully understand what was happening. And were still arguing about who was going to be the greatest. And I think that's one of the unique things about the communion service that helps us recognize as believers that on this earth we are all called to be servants. Just as Jesus set the example, he says, I'm as one of you that serve rather than the one being served. And as we look at the marriage supper of the Lamb, we're going to sit at the table with Jesus and be served. Doesn't mean that we're equal with Christ, but yet we are going to have great honor at that marriage supper of the Lamb. It's interesting, as we saw here, it talked about them sitting on thrones. So even though Jesus reminded them that they were called to serve rather than being served, it is interesting that he talks about them sitting on thrones and judging the tribes of Israel. Does that mean that each one of us will have our own throne? I don't believe so, but I don't completely understand it either. But I think recognizing that it does not matter what our position is here on earth or in heaven, the key is that we are part of that marriage supper of the Lamb, that we have been called and that we accept the invitation. I don't think we need to worry about who will have a higher seat. I don't think it'll have anything to do with positions we had here, whether you were the one of the trustees that helps clean the church fix the church, or whether you're the bishop, whether you were just a lowly primary Sunday school teacher, when we get to heaven, those things are not going to be what determines our position or our honor. But at the same time, we are called to be faithful and to take communion together as a brotherhood. I hope that we are excited today as we take part in this communion recognizing that someday I had to think of the saying where the Jews say next year in Jerusalem maybe we as Christians should say well maybe next year we'll have communion with Christ we don't know when that time will come but we need to be prepared as we saw and in closing I want to return back to Revelations chapter 19 just to read a few of those verses again
picking up at verse 5. And I heard a voice out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And so God is calling this. Verse 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. We can be a part of that wife, and I hope that each one of us are today, if we are Christians walking with him. I hope that we look at communion as a time of celebrating, commemorating what Christ did, remembering with seriousness the incredible sacrifice that he made, but also thinking of what, we, what lies before us when he calls us home. And I hope it gets us excited also and that we look forward to it. The Lord bless each one of you.